world of e-commerce can be tricky, and that's why you need the experts to help take you to the next level. This is Delivering E-Commerce, and this is Chris Parsons. What is going on, guys? Hello, good evening. Hey, hey, Johnny. All right, so I know YouTube's got a little bit of a delay, so hopefully it's now sending out reminders to everyone that uh, we're going to be live tonight with the Q&A. So I see we have one person watching. It's probably myself. Um, <laughs> and we'll uh, we'll get going with this. But um, while, uh, while we wait for folks to, uh, to join, as I'm sure they're having... Uh, Having dinner and stuff. I, I wanted to talk about some headlines that I saw in the in the news as we wait for people to jump on and do the the Q and A. So um, <clears throat> I saw that Macy's is suing Amazon for their billboard that's at Herald Square. Have you guys saw that that announcement? You know that iconic billboard that Macy has. Uh, Macy's has. It's I guess Amazon's trying to get that, and uh, I just thought it was interesting to see that uh, folks will. Uh, We'll play that game still in, in retail about fighting for each other's space and probably don't even have any analytics on how valuable it is, but they're they're going to go toe to toe on it. So Macy's is suing Amazon? Yeah. Okay. They must be the first to be suing Amazon. <laughs> yeah, the first is weak. <laughs> if Amazon loves anything, it's a good lawsuit. Oh, yeah. And your margin. That's funny. And then... Then what I saw, I was really proud because I worked for this company, Ren's Pets, um, a couple of years ago. And uh, I just saw a number of announcements on some of the technical enhancements that their stores and their online business has been is making over the last year or so. And uh, I just think they're killing it from a seamless, you know, Johnny, one of our first conversations was about that seamless personalized shopping experience and cross channel. And uh, I think Ren's Pets is kind of this now staple of what a retailer should be doing. So I don't know if you guys have saw that recently. I saw you share that article. Is that the one where um, they also talked about the marketplace? Um, the I don't know if I, I got down to the marketplace, but ultimately what they were, what they've been doing is opening up multiple stores and really integrating the, that online uh, ship to store experience. They've got lockers in those stores as well. So, um, the, and the technology that they invested in, they can really do a great job with, with customer relation management. It's not, it's not like they'll ever be in a situation we are currently where someone buys in store, maybe a barbecue right. and tomorrow we're going to send them an email to buy a barbecue because we don't have that, that true uh, connection with our stores. They will never run into that problem because they've invested in their, their technology. Yeah. Isn't it interesting? Like any, anybody who starts up today, whether it's stores or just pure e-com that you, you have that data from day one. Yeah, exactly. That legacy stuff is, is not involved. Joseph, have you seen any other trends in the industry lately? Well, first, I mean, I'd, I'd love to say, you know, as, as someone, I live in Chicago now, but as someone that was born and raised in, in Mississauga, Ontario, you know, I've, I've, I've spent several you know, trips to Wrens and I'm happy to see that they're, they're making the, the jump there. So I spent some time in their Dundas store, obviously. I've had pets my whole life. So uh, glad to see that Wrens is doing well. I think from a trends perspective, I mean, we I think retailers, consumers, everyone's going to have to be ready for a massive Q4 crunch. We know that logistics have, you know, really done some damage um, to retail over the last 18 months, and it's going to get pretty serious here. Uh, I think Christmas, we're going to see a lot of retailers with empty shelves, um, a lot of missing product, and a lot of inability to, um, to move. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. You jumped right into one of the other headlines that I saw, and FedEx announced that uh, 35 to 40 percent of their staff they're short on. Like they're operating at a 60 60 percent capacity in the U.S. on their DCs and distributing. So that you talk about an opportunity. If that's now, as we get into the increased volumes um, going into Q4, that's going to cause a lot of people to miss Christmas. So I hope people are shopping early this year. I hope so too. And then um, this is going to be right up Johnny's alley because um, there was also a, a headline talking about um, the number one skill as a leader is empathy. Hmm. And uh, I don't know how that list on your book is talking about empathy, where that chapter is, but uh, 
Johnny, where, where do you want to go with that? Yeah, it's, it's in there for sure. I think it's just, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, Michelle Romana on, on LinkedIn, uh, about a month ago, she talked about this, like, give me your top three leadership traits and stuff like that. And I, and I answered and she, she responded back. So I was happy about that. But, but yeah, it's really like human to human relationships, right? And, and connections and, and, and uh, that might sound so obvious, but it's not, especially when you get into stress, stressful situations, especially as Q4 ramps up, especially as some days are not good and, and whether that's personal or, or work related and you kind of take it out on your team or, or some employees uh, that you're working with, whether it's virtual or in the office, um, that's a huge part of it. So I'm glad that's happening. I think it's changing. I think we see it in sports too, right? Like all these things coming out, about like how coaches are, what they've done to players and, and how they treated them. And now um, we see it in the work world. And uh, I think it's good. I think there's a new breed of leadership. I think leaders that perhaps weren't as empathetic or learning, um, which is great, right? Hey, yep. you, you know, maybe it worked for a certain time the way that things were done, but I don't think that's uh, the new breed of, of employees, what they're looking for. Um, I, I think even companies like Amazon are realizing that, right? Not to get into Amazon again, but um, you see they've, they've been challenged with their workforce and they've had shortages. Uh, you know, I can tell you as an Amazon FBA um, customer, we, we've seen it, and you know they've halted some some shipments on replenishment to go in. They don't have the employees to staff the DCs, and uh, you know that's part COVID and part I think them not you know like them burning out employees so quickly, right? They they have how many DCs in Canada? Obviously, you need thousands of employees there, and, and you see it now. They're trying to increase minimum wage, right, or or the wages, sorry, from like seventeen to twenty something. So twenty one, I think it was twenty one. Yeah, right, twenty one sixty five or something like that. Like. Yeah. So um, it, it's happening, but back to empathy. I think uh, as a leader, there's certain core things that you have to have today, and that's one of them. I, I agree. If I could, if I could jump in here, I think empathy is, you know, I think it's it's not just a leadership trait. It's you know, it's a life trait, right? I think, you know, the challenge with empathy is that most people aren't born naturally, you know, being an empathetic person, right? I think a lot of people, you know, myself included, I had to I had to learn empathy, right? I would. Yeah automatically jump to, you know, someone came to me with, with a problem, I would automatically jump to, how do I solve it? How do I help solve it, right? That's not always the best uh, approach. So I think, you know, I myself had to learn about empathy um, and I've had to study it. I've had, you know, many discussions at home with my beautiful wife about empathy and, and, and helping to understand that. So I think it's a leadership trait, but it's also a life trait. Like I think everybody needs to have a sense of empathy and everyone should take time to really understand what it is and how to use it to your advantage. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, especially, I think my first time managing and leading people at Walmart, I probably was not empathetic. I was like, you want a, a star for getting up in the morning, putting your pants on and coming to work? Forget it. I'm not going to give that to you. But you don't understand the challenges that people may have at home. And you know what? If they were late for a few weeks, you know, don't just scold them over it. Understand why that change in that behavior happened and, you know, offer some solutions and, and be empathetic towards what they have going on. And, and historically, I wouldn't have done that. And uh, as I matured into my leadership, it uh, you started understanding why, because otherwise you just have a revolving door of staff and you just, you know, you don't have that rapport and that, that connection with your team. So I think it's a, it's a great skill for everyone to pick up and I was glad I saw that article because I know Johnny and I talked about it probably five months ago and uh, finally other people are listening to him. So um, the other the other thing in the news that I saw was uh, TikTok. And um, as of, I guess, a couple of weeks ago, they are the now the most watched channel surpassing YouTube for average time spent um, customers consuming dialogue. Now, what does that mean, Johnny, for a retailer? Yeah, I think we're all trying to figure that out, right? Uh, as uh, I mean, it, it's a uh, it, one. Where do your dollars go now, right? And and someone I, I read an article the other day. It's like, listen, maybe you need to be on TikTok, and maybe you don't. Yeah. Like depending on your target, right? And I think we're we're trying to figure that out. I, I think it it tilted so much to like, okay, we had paid media, and then it went to influencers, and now we're trying to figure out, okay, influencers, but that's broken down now into TikTok and Instagram and wherever other channels, right? So it, it's it's something to, to keep an eye on as well as the next channel that, you know, come, comes along. But um, I'm sure everyone felt the influence of social media 
yesterday when, when Instagram and Facebook are down for you know six or eight hours. So uh, I think it's becoming more and more uh, pertinent to follow these. But but again, back to like, is your audience there? Because right. if your target is not yet on on TikTok, do you dive heavily into that? Um, but I think we're learning something about short content video, right? Which, right. which uh, uh, you know, I think people are still doing the long form stuff every once in a while, which is probably fine for YouTube and those channels. But I think we're we're all into that 15 second now and, and out uh, routine. So TikTok's perfect. And Joseph, what's your advice for retailers trying to engage with an audience through whether it's YouTube, TikTok or, or whatever channel? I always say it, you have to figure out the message you can't just insert yourself in there and pushing product you, you have to look at each channel and, and really decide how you're going to play a role in it but what, what advice do you give yeah i mean i'm not surprised that that tiktok's been on such a rage and that it gets more hours uh consumed than youtube i think for 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 many of my clients specifically at round two um you know we work with a lot of beauty and apparel brands oftentimes with a younger demo. And this is where they get their biggest bang from the buck. It's not Facebook and Instagram anymore for a lot of those brands. It's TikTok. That is the number one channel for, for a lot of, our, um, for a lot of our, our, our customers and our clients. But I think the key is with any channel, I mean, you need to really understand the format that's important, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a different, uh, it's a different size. It's a different type of content. TikTok is definitely very heavily skewed towards user generated content versus your traditional kind of YouTube advertising. So you need to have a custom tailored approach for each one of these platforms, especially TikTok. Yeah, agreed. All right. So I, the audience must be shy tonight because I've seen up to 10 and 12 people on and then uh, no questions so far. So I'm going to dive into the questions that people pre-submitted to us. Um, so one of the questions was, What's the industry best practice for incre increasing engagement and reducing cart abandonment? Um, so who wants to jump in on that one first? Don't, don't, I, I can don't jump in. silent on me. Go ahead, I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, right. You know, I, I'll, 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 I guess there's two questions there, right? How do you increase engagement? How do you decrease your, your cart abandonment rates? So I think, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to think about this with my uh, performance digital hat on, right? My media hat essentially. And I think, What's incredibly important to know with engagement, first and foremost, is you need to know your audience, right? You need to ensure that you're able to identify who your core audience is, where they're consuming media, and how can we go about creating the message and putting it in the right spot to encourage them to visit the site, right? Because I think it doesn't matter if you have the best content in the world, if you're not targeting the right audience, it doesn't matter. They're gonna get to your site and they're gonna leave, right? First and foremost. Second is I'd really, uh, encourage all of our clients to to really deep dive into their content, right? Get a sense of what's working well, what's not working well. Take a look at the competitive set. See who the top sellers are on Amazon. What kind of images are they using? What kind of videos are they using? Are they using you know unboxing videos? Or are they are they including you know um, use, using the actual product themselves? What are they including in their descriptions and bullets? What are people saying about the products? Look at ratings and reviews and get a sense of what do people like about specific products? What do people hate about them? Is there anything that you could be taking from that UGC to help influence your product detail pages, right? Mm -hmm. To make your images and videos a little more relevant. I think those are the things that are gonna really increase the engagement on the site, plus a million other things. But with my performance digital hat on, it's about knowing your audience and driving the right audience but also making sure that you have the best possible content on your product detail pages ultimately. Yeah, right on. And if, if I could add, so because that question, I assume it's right from a, from a site perspective, an e-commerce site yeah. perspective. So, and that, that question is a, is a, is a great one and it's a general one. So I would say, break it down. Here's some actionable steps, like take an Excel sheet or whatever you want, a Trello board. And, you know, Joseph mentioned product detail page, product detail page is one of them take your site and compare it to who you think is the industry standard in your industry, right? If you sell pet items or you sell tires or you sell apparel, see the best one or two sites and, and just compare the product detail pages, for instance, is the checkout at the right spot in, when you scroll down on a mobile or, or desktop screen. And I would, I would take those chunks, like take your templates, product detail page, checkout, product list pages or collection pages, homepage, start from there and really compare because in one fell swoop, you can't just say, you know, let's increase conversion and just, you know, attack it from a broad level. 
like focus on those four or five templates that are really going to have an impact. And also look what your, you know, the, the people in your industry, the best ones are doing as a best practice. But uh, I think if you break that down and say, you know what, this month is PDP month and just attack product detail page with testing and UX, um, I think you're going to get somewhere really quickly. Yeah, I agreed. That's great comments, guys. Uh, hopefully the audience has taken some notes. And uh, I think the only piece that I would add is when we talk about the product landing pages and having good content, I also think we need to go above and beyond and offer up some unique content. And what I mean by that is if we're selling barbecues online and uh, you have all the same specs as your competition, you're not, you're not doing anything above and beyond for the customer. You're just doing status quo. So how do you go and you add to the, to the page a video about how to clean that barbecue or how to store it correctly or, or how to, you know, just, there's all kinds of user scenarios that we should start generating content specifically to solve some of those customer journeys and needs with a product. And I think that's when you start to build up authority on, on content and consumers will then start to tell each other, yeah, you can look at any other XYZ site and you'll get the specs, but these guys go above and beyond. Maybe it's how to assemble um, the product and not just show those manuals of how to assemble it, truly set it up, put a video there and give customers the confidence to, to set that product up right now. So um, I know we've got lots of people on. So does anyone on have a question for us? It would really be helpful on a Q&A to get some questions from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so don't be shy. Just put them into the, uh, the comment section and ask away. But we'll get into the next question that uh, was submitted. And that's um, someone wanting to understand. And to me, uh, we've been in this industry long enough. But I, I thought it was you know relevant for anyone that's new into to retail. Is what's the difference between omni-channel and multi-channel? And, uh, you know, who wants to grab this one first? And I think we all have similar answers to this. Yeah, I mean, I could. Uh, so I, I, I've been saying this for a long time, and it sounds like it, could, it just happened. But, like, uh, I always thought omni-channel was about eliminating channels. Right? Right. Like, like, if the customer gets an email and goes into the store and they buy something, whether, you know, they buy one item at the store and the other one's going to be shipped to their house in four days, whatever it is like the customer doesn't go back home and, and said you know i had this great experience with a store or not like it's about the brand right they'll always name the brand that they buy not which channel they bought it on like no one says yeah did you buy that online or did you go to that store in toronto like so i always say like forget if you if the customer doesn't know what channel they're in that's amazing that's amazing whether and even if they check out on instagram you know and all that like that that is really great so in terms of multi-channel or omni-channel from a real definition perspective right a lot of people think about a multi-channel as a marketing perspective like you do email you do paid media you do all your marketing channels and omni-channel more like for when you have stores and the online channel um that's really like the definition but from a customer perspective it's not like they know what personalization is right like right. like computer sales it's just like the customer just wants to know that you know they're making some effort to know who i am but like they don't know about personalization technologies or some of the stuff that we're, we're doing on behind the scenes as digital marketers yeah great point so i, I mean the way i was defining it and, and it's funny we we are different on this is um multi-channel was um, you would have marketers focus on what was going to be displayed and presented at store level, and then you would have um, different ideas for, for online, and each channel was being managed kind of in a silo. And then from the omni-channel perspective, or I love the way Steve Dennis puts it, is the harmonized shopping experience is the fact that, like you said, it's seamless to the customer. You've got a very similar story across whether it's mobile, your website, your in-store, and to a customer, they're shopping a brand or brand, and you've just made it um, a pleasurable experience across all the different touch points with it that's telling a very similar story, whether you're a low cost operator, um, value propositions, whatever that story is, it's consistent across all of them. Yeah, and I mean, I really, I, I really uh, have nothing else to add. I think Johnny and Chris, you guys did a great job of explaining Great. Johnny, I think we, uh, sorry, Joseph, I think we have a question from somebody other than me. <laughs> See, all right. So what would be the top skills to help someone pivot from a normal to a, from a normal to a new normal world and to in turn add value to a company's bottom line? Yeah. I mean, if obviously I think we're referring to the COVID environment and how we had to pivot and really become an online 
first because all of our stores were shut down and closed. And um, so, you know, all the marketing plans that we put in place to drive footsteps in the store kind of went to driving footsteps to a channel that they can get to and going and then adding curbside pickup and all of these different touch points at store level. Um, so we went from this normal e-commerce representing what 10% of the industry to spiking to 20, 30% in some verticals. So, um, and now the new normal is it's a blended shopper. In my opinion, customers are going to shop across store on online and mobile, depending on their needs, where they're going, if they're traveling to their cottage, they may order ahead and have that product shipped to, to their cottage, or you know what, they forgot to order stuff online and they're going to stop along their way to a, to the cottage and pick up what they need from a store. I don't think too many customers now shop one channel versus the other. It's based on where they are in the week, where they are in the day. And um, we have to be there to be seamless for them and let them shop how they want to shop with us. Yeah. And just on, on the topic of skills, right? Like learning those skill, skills, how do you, how, how, how do you learn them, them quickly? I mean, um, just some helpful hints because I think this is a great time Say you were in the traditional side of, of marketing or, or, you know, retail and you're trying to pivot into digital and, you know, faster pace and all this change with technology. I think that's great because you can catch up. Like there's so much runway ahead of us, right? We're talking about TikTok. Like, yeah, there's, there's, there's knowing about it, but there's being an expertise, right? Which you could, you could do that quickly, relatively quickly uh, if, if you want to. And, and here's some helpful advice that, that I'm implementing as we go, but like, Pick a, pick a topic or a channel that you want to learn about and focus on it for that month for four weeks. One, one or two articles, one or two blog posts, one or two podcasts a week, one to two hours, say. You know, say it's email. Say it's email. You're, you don't know much about email. You want to focus on email. Maybe that's where you want to be in your future. And and you do it, right? And, and hope maybe you have a test that you can – or maybe your, your company will allow you into their email team and, uh, you know, we'll learn from – someone but i think that's the the best way to just kind of break it up because you could get lost right and in this easily it's like there is so much here where do i where do i start so i would just pick maybe by channel or by uh, technology yeah i think i think that's a great uh point john i think if you're if you're an individual um and you're looking to kind of you know take a, a new step into this new world i think you know two key traits are, are incredibly important right I think the people that are going to succeed in making the transition are people that, you know, are they have the initiative. So first and foremost, they're able to identify that, hey, I think I need to make a change here. I need to do something new. Um, but they also um, and they have the will to do it. Right. And they want to do it. But also they're resourceful. Right. They're able to go out and figure things out on their own in a lot of cases. Um, luckily, there are a lot of sources um, that you can leverage to increase your knowledge share in any given category now. I encourage you the way that, you know, Chris, Johnny and I have been interacting uh, lately has been purely on LinkedIn, right? Like LinkedIn is a huge resource. All you have to do is start doing some research, finding out who's who on LinkedIn to go after uh, and follow. I mean, whether you're connected to them or not, but you can follow them and, and get a good sense of, you know, what are they talking about? What resources are they um, using? How are they identifying what's new in this new world and what you need to do um, to, to potentially pivot there as well? So I think initiative and resourcefulness are two incredible um, traits or skills that, that should be leveraged. Fantastic. And then I see that uh, Melanie's asked us a question as well. Yeah, so Melanie says, Melanie asks, I've heard some leaders in retail comment that customers don't shop multiple channels. They pick their preferred method and stick to it, in-store or online. What are your thoughts on this? So Melanie knows that this is a pet peeve of mine, so she's trying to get me heated with answering this one for sure. So, <laughs> I'll let somebody else respond. Oh. Before yeah, I think we I think we've all gone through that in like 2013, 2014, 2015. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I hope there's some just in that in that. And I'm sure that it's still applicable in a lot of ways. But um, yeah, I think you just got to look at yourself. Right. I mean, like, say you have four friends or family members, like ask them how they're shopping. I was like, what? What do you mean? I sometimes go to the store. I sometimes go online. I sometimes use my mobile. I sometimes check out here or there. Like, yeah, it's just so cross right now. Right. And, and and all executives are, are seeing that I can I know that there's been a big shift uh, in retail on that end. 
yeah, yeah for sure. I think like you don't have to look far. Just look again, like Johnny said, look at your own activity. Like how do you shop, right? I yesterday had to go buy some new Uniball pens, right? Because my, my pens died. I went on to Google. I looked up Uniball pens near me. My local Walgreens, you know, had, had stock in, in store. And I went to the store and I bought pens. It was the first time I've, you know, I bought something in store in quite a while. Usually, usually I'd get it from Amazon or, you know, an immediate purchase, but I had the need right away. And I did my shopping or did my research online and I picked it up. In yeah, no joke. I, I bought two pens from a pharmacy two days ago as well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't buy my pens. <laughs> oh, I get them here. Um, but yeah, so Melanie, um, you know, I've heard those same things and I think it's our job to educate and do storytelling to anyone in the industry that still thinks that way. Um, really what I, what I always try to tell people is people have been shopping multiple channels or omni channel for years. They just, we didn't have a term for it. So if you think back to the Sears catalog and how customers would flip through pages and go through and pick their items or call and place an order on those those items that's the same what we're doing now we've just digitized it right so they've been shopping for years through through multiple omni-channel experiences we've just now finally have technology that's caught up and can really start serving the customer in in this day and age with a, a much more seamless experience but it's like for for anyone that says customers don't shop multiple channels they just have to think back of history and how curbside pickup hell milk used to be delivered to your door and we went away from that right and now and now home delivery is this big thing because we we've just go in circles right it's now people are going COVID's over they want to go back to the stores they're experiencing that now i've heard from people the store experience is so bad because the in stock is not there they've wasted an hour at the mall now they're shifting back this month to online again because guess what they don't have to waste that time going to the mall it's far more convenient so i think it's Customers are going to go through these ebbs and flows of, of channels, and uh, we just we have to be there to serve them through through their whole journey. And social selling, right? Like you you mentioned uh, some social medias um, yesterday. I thought people were having withdrawal syndromes on on Facebook because they couldn't get onto it. And ultimately, social selling is now representing what's the stat? Thirty percent of e-commerce sales. Like that's a significant chunk. And if you're not being where those customers are and engaging with them in the right spot shame on us that's a miss so i think that's where i would have those conversations with uh anyone that's that's got this outdated kind of philosophy um, I, yeah and, and to add to that chris i would i would say there's probably a thousand examples in the last 10 years of industry executives of very senior level positions uh that made statements like that that no longer have companies <laughs> right that's a great point that is so good jobs yeah <laughs> yeah well i mean i i remember um fondly my time at walmart and when i first got the rule for for e-commerce and building out e-commerce um, we were competing against the mindset of opening up Sam's Clubs. So I don't know if you remember them. They're no longer here, but uh, Sam's Clubs and making super centers. So, you know, I had to fight for share of voice on why digital was important and all of these other touch points were important versus just growing bricks and mortar. And, you know, ultimately, a lot of the dollars I didn't get until about three years later because our leadership did go ahead with Sam's Club and we did invest in. Um, a model that we couldn't really compete in. Whereas if we would have invested into the e-commerce channel three years earlier, um, maybe it would have been far more significant for the company, but hindsight's 2020, I guess. Um, so let's, uh, let's hope that the questions keep coming in. And I see that we keep popping up and down between uh, 11 people watching. So people are tuning in and out uh, as they try to probably have dinner in some cases. But um, one of the other questions that was submitted was what are some, examples of an omni-channel strategy and it's funny that omni-channel is becoming this big topic again the, the omni-channel kind of died as far as conversation and i guess everyone was trying to avoid the term but um yeah so what are some of the the, uh, the strategies you guys are seeing i get I'll, I'll jump in i'll jump in first there i think you know i i'm, I'm based here in the u.s now um and I always think about the, the big retailers here 
uh, Walmart and Target are probably two examples and most obvious examples of, of you know, retailers that are doing a really great job in terms of omnichannel, right? Um, Target has done a great job in, in developing their app, getting all their inventory, developing a marketplace, getting everything into their app and, and website so that you can convert online. Mm -hmm. And you can either have it shipped to your, to your house or you can have it shipped to the store or you can pick it up in store, right? And they use, you know, the interesting thing about Target is that most of their distribution centers are their actual stores themselves, right? So it's, it's local products um, in, in, a, in a lot of cases. Walmart, it doesn't matter. You know, I can, I can open up the app. I can create my shopping list. I can, you know, go in there whenever I want to. If I, if I forget something or my wife forgets something to put on the list, we can add it whenever we want. We can schedule our, our pickup. We can pick it up in store. We can pick it up curbside or we can go in store um, ourselves. I think that's really the true, you know, experience when it comes to Omnichannel. It doesn't matter where you are. The experience is the same ultimately, and you can choose which experience you want. Yeah, I'm going to just try to go outside the box because I think those examples are great. Best Buy, what they're doing from a purely omnichannel perspective has been fascinating and by one of the first, especially in Canada, to, to do so. But uh, if you think of Amazon, okay, Amazon's purely online, right? But they're not now with all the lockers that they have. They're creating this experience of like, hey, we have these lockers here. You can ship it there. You know, if you're not home, don't worry about it. Go get it there. So, like, that, we don't think about it too much, but Amazon's kind of becoming that omni-channel. Forgetting, you know, they're obviously opening up physical stores and, and some of the acquisitions that they've made on the grocery side, you know, that's for sure omni-channel. But just thinking of a locker and how they can be positioning that. Um, the the uh, the other example that, that comes to mind um, is, you know, I mentioned Best Buy just from a seamless experience, but, like, it truly is the, the standard, right? If you if you think about it in, in Canada on, on how they've been been doing it from a technology perspective, shopping any way you want, any way you're you're comfortable with. Um, you know, we, we look at them quite a bit, or I look at them quite a bit to see what what they're up to uh, next. And then you know, marketplace. So they develop their own marketplace as well, and all that is happening. So um, just a couple of examples: one traditional, and one kind of outside the box that we might not think of as omnichannel, but it is. That's great. I, 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 whenever I think about some of the strategies I see, I love when a retailer empowers the associates at store level in giving them tablets or in letting them engage with digital technology in store. So that way, if a customer walks up the shelf and that item is out of stock, a lot of, well, not a lot, but some of the retailers are allowing for, you know, we'll get you that item. You don't worry. We'll, we'll ship it to your home and you don't have to come back and visit us. And I think that's the experience customers are looking for to, to go back and forth between the store to hope that they, they get it in from another location. That's just such a old outdated experience. And when, when they say, don't worry, we'll get it for you and get it to your home. That's what the convenience I'm looking for as a shopper. So I, I love when they do that. And, you know, I, I think the, uh, the bigger trend is now also, we have this whole, I think 60% of all e-commerce orders are being picked up at store. So I think really e-commerce and the store have to have a conversation. What's that experience really look like? So whether they're picking it up at their car and you have to take it out to their vehicle or whether they're actually coming in and picking up at a designated location, I think a lot of retailers still struggle with that, that experience. And just because you've numbered a parking spot with a destination and put a phone number, I, I think you know, how prepared are you for that customer when they come? Maybe they've ordered something and it needs batteries. And you, as an associate, you should be prepared for that customer and make a recommendation to get them those batteries or that HDMI cable for whatever they're picking up or, or whatever. Don't let them go home and realize that they didn't get this stuff. That's such a terrible experience. And I, I think we can do much better being prepared for a customer pickup than we currently do. Yeah, and, and if I could add on on kind of the convenience, but also the outside of the box omni-channel. Um, so I was in the Okanagan like a month and a half ago, um, and was ordering wine and, and so on. And, and what I what I saw, like I'm not in the BC area, right? But but what they're doing is actually sending shipments. If you're not, let's say, in Kelowna and you're in Vancouver, uh, sending shipments for free to Vancouver restaurants. So you go and you pick it up, and, and then like for the restaurant, like we were talking about you know, retail, and sometimes we, we forget about restaurants and service, but the restaurant, I mean, hey, serve these people, 
you know, have them sit down, make a reservation and, and there you go. So kind of working, working both angles, but just like an outside the box, you know, we don't often think of how can restaurants be totally omnichannel. Obviously there's Uber Eats and delivery and then there's sit down. But um, I thought that was a neat example of like wine to restaurant and then customer can come in and hopefully stay. Yeah, I like that idea. And I, maybe I should start using that as I sit and wait for my grocery order to pick up a restaurant delivering to my car because sometimes it takes forever and I could really use a meal while I wait. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have tried that grocery shopping experience and you, you go and you don't want to walk around the store for 45 minutes, 50 minutes, picking out your groceries. So you do all the planning ahead, you order it and you still end up sitting in the parking lot for 50 minutes. I would have rather gone shopping in the store to go get those items than to sit in my car. But, uh, Oh, well, we'll get, we'll get there, right? It's the industry still learning. Um, I yeah, see I Irwin's so. got a question for us, and I haven't seen Irwin in, gosh, a long time. Irwin, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate that. Irwin and I met at Click. Click was helping Walmart out with some digital solutions way back a long time. So, Irwin, thank you for joining us. Uh, Joseph, what's that question? Yeah, so Erwin says, hey, Chris, curious to get this group's perspective. Look into the future for us. 12 months from now, when you look back at the year that was in e-commerce, what will be what will we be amazed at as consumers? Oh, that's a great question. I, I, think, I think the consumers won't actually be amazed by much. I think seamlessly, everyone's working so hard behind the scenes to still deliver. Like, how many... Uh, ship and containers are not coming and you know I think to to us I think we're going to take some great pride of coming through this successfully and and meeting our numbers and surpassing our targets um, from a customer perspective they won't even be as oppressed as, as we were that we made this year happen and um, that's I think that's the unfortunate truth and and they shouldn't they shouldn't be patting us on the back for for just getting this done but I think what consumers, will actually start to see down the road is that experience from whether it's different pickup options, um, maybe better negotiated shipping rates, because we've all grown and matured so much in, in e-commerce that we've become better. And I think our planning will be more sophisticated going forward. And I don't think, I think we're now going to find ways to pivot from a, a year that was planned. So Johnny, you may do the same, Joseph, we plan our calendar for next year, like nine months in advance. And, by having gone through COVID, we, we've now got some processes to make us more agile and be able to pivot faster where before it was like, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? Flyers are already kind of being distributed mm -hmm. and the stores are being locked down. How do, you, how do you react? So I think consumers will now have a better retail experience because of the learnings we had and we're forced to learn quickly over the last 18 months. Yeah, I think, so everything you said totally on and, and I think, um, you know, the, I think most people realize what, what's happening at the port, right? And having issues getting yeah. product in. But I think when it's in the country, or let's say North America, I actually think people are pleasantly surprised that an order gets to them in like three or four days with all that's going on, yeah. right? Like we, we know that there's delays. Guys, you call customer service, it's like 30 minutes to an hour, right? Like there's shortage of people in restaurants everywhere. Like in Canada, we're, we're feeling it especially. I think the U.S. is too. Like, so like getting an order in three days when it said like four to five. Like, I'm super ecstatic about the industry. And and you know we're ramping up. This is September, October. Like these are core months for us, right? This isn't like May. Like these are core mm -hmm. months for the industry. So now now the pressure is going to switch from the retailers to the logistics companies, Transport Canada Post, USPS, all those guys. And it'll be interesting to see how they handle it because they've obviously had a year and two years and three years to keep building this. But, but as a consumer, I'm going to look back and be like, you know what? Some of these brands are doing well because they're processing the order within the hour, which is all they can do. And then they hand it off, but they're processing it so close to like when you order, it's fantastic. And, and these are some of the brands that struggle with retail. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking of like big major iconic retailers in Canada with lots of stores and, and they're, they're doing it. So kudos to them. Yeah. I think it's going to be the, uh, the meteoric rise of TikTok. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I honestly like. I, I don't think there's going to be anything that's really, you know, that will that will be totally amazed at as consumers. I think we're kind of numb to a lot of a, a lot of things now. But I do think the upcoming supply chain challenges um, they're going to put 
they're going to put real stress on on everyone. Uh, we're feeling it already, you know, from a U.S. perspective. Definitely, Amazon's really the only one right now that can, you know, still for the most part guarantee that you'll get your package within two days. We're seeing a lot of um, a lot of other retailers, especially in the in the direct consumer side. We work with a lot of startup uh, startup brands that you know, have had relatively explosive growth that are just they're out of inventory and they're constantly running out of inventory. And it's a massive challenge. They're, you know, they're sitting for weeks. They've got, you know, fall fashion um, shirts, pants, jackets sitting on shipping containers that they can't sell. They literally can't move them. And fall shopping season is almost over. Right. So it's like, I think from a consumer standpoint, I don't think there's going to be too much to be amazed at, but I think from a business standpoint, there's gonna be a lot of businesses that are, you know, in, um, in a very uncomfortable position. Yeah. And so, you know, Erwin, I think, you know, looking out two, three years, what customers are going to be amazed is all of these efficiencies that we are figuring out fast because we are forced to, is just going to create a much more rich customer um, total experience. And I mean, you know, from the standpoint of personalization and getting real recommendations, um, drone delivery, perhaps, has, has moved forward faster. Our logistics and automation that we have, the artificial intelligence that's coming from Google, all of those things are just, they, they will be kind of behind the scenes. Customers won't really know what they're dealing with, but I think those things are just gonna create a much richer customer journey and customer experience um, from us fast forwarding and investing more into to digital than we typically would have. Um, and now I think they'll pay, the customer will get actually big benefits down the road from that stuff. Um, I think we've got another question, Dominic. We do. We've got a question from Dominic. Um, Dominic asks, what would you recommend of the top three things small online businesses need to pay attention to next year? Oh, sweet. So I'll jump in on this one, guys, at first, if you don't mind. I think any small business needs to understand their P&L. Right away, margins on product and P&L because it's great to think that you want to be innovative and you want to add new technology. If your margins on your product don't allow for you to do those things, then don't do them because you're just going to kill your business. So you, you have to make sure your PL is there from some small things that an online business can do and pay attention to next year is what their customers are saying, like do some surveys and really reach out to your customers and, and put some plans in place now, like reach out now and put plans in place for next year, understanding your customer. I had um, a couple of sales guys on a, a podcast of mine the other day, and they were saying they went in to go and sell their service to a small small business. And the gentleman didn't have the foresight to say why they, they needed that. And they were just basically told, no, go ahead, you guys, we don't need your services. And I said, and then they were, they were really disgruntled, the fact that the business owner couldn't see the vision of why they needed this. And I was like, guys, you got to understand we're living day to day. We're putting out a thousand fires. It's up to you to come back with some real reasons why your service is going to cut through the clutter. And I told them, I said, go out in front of that guy's store and interview and survey his customers and then come back two weeks, a month later and say, look, Mr. Sir, last time we met, you said you didn't see value. We actually did surveys of your true customers, and this is their response, and this is why they're saying they would love our service. Can you now see how it's a fit? So I think you got to change up some of your your tactics with with how you approach people, and not just take a no as a no. No means no today, but it doesn't mean no forever. Um, and I think you know, I think as a sales guy, I think we need to do more research and understand whether it's a customer or the store. Um, and be able to go and, and talk to the small businesses. And, and lastly, I think one of the things I would recommend for any small business to do is, is right now understand the flow of your goods because um, you're still going to run into the same problems next year that we're having. They're, they're, they're not cleaning this up in any significant way. Uh, so if you're sitting there and you're putting together your P&L and your top selling SKU is not going to be in stock, you need to rethink your, your numbers. So uh, that, that'd be my advice is more about the numbers this year. And I'm sure you guys have some great digital tactics and some other things, but P and L to me is, is core to, to success. Yeah. So yeah, I'll go another route uh, just to, to play devil's advocate, I guess, but yeah. um, 
So I'm, I'm going to small online business, relatively new. I'm going to say tech stack is probably good. Okay, so I'm yeah. not going to. I'll leave that out. But tech stack, I'm thinking you're on Shopify. You're good to go. Uh, but I would I would say uh, product, right? The product's got to be obviously really worth selling. So I would say focus on the product, and it doesn't have to be an assortment of a thousand SKUs, but focus mm-hmm. on that product. The next thing is traffic. And, and traffic, I don't just mean like website visits, but eyeballs as well on social channels, right? So build that social following because like if you do have the great traffic and nothing's coming to your site, you, you may end up being a wholesaler, right? Because if no one's going to buy your product on your site or on your, your channels, um, you're going to have to sell that product somewhere else. So traffic is, is imperative, especially for a small online business who, who might not have the funds figure out a way to, to get traffic to that, to that site. And the third one is, um, you know, going back to like what Erwin was saying about that 12 months, I really think service is going to be a, a differentiator. I, I think we're going to be stuck in this. Hey, we don't have enough employees to staff this for for like a, a year or so. And I think service, wait times, how you use live chat, how you incorporate all that is going to be a big thing. Because I think there's people, whether it's in the travel industry or just shopping for, for apparel or, or smaller goods, um, they have a question that's being unanswered and they're not proceeding. So there's items in their, in their cart and they're just not going to check out because they have a question on a size or a fit or something. Uh, same with airlines. They're like ready to book, but they're not quite sure about something and they just can't get through. Um, so I, I think service is, is uh, the third one. Yeah. Great, great points, Johnny. Joseph. Yeah, I think um, I've seen, you know, a lot of businesses make the mistake of setting up, you know, a Shopify website and then throwing a bunch of money into paid media. Right? I think there's a place, there's a place for paid media, but there is a lot of things that need to happen first and foremost. And I'm a paid media person. Like that is my entire background. 21 years in the industry. Um, I think for a small business, make sure that you've built the right infrastructure. Right? Like Johnny said, I'm assuming that the business is on Shopify. It's got all the right plugins, but I think what's equally important is being able to develop your story, right? Like why why should someone buy your product or why should they buy that product from you specifically, right? So I think being able to bridge the gap between building the right infrastructure and then amplifying your message with paid, you have to really understand your story, your proposition, your why, before you can start pushing all of that messaging out. And I think all those things need to come you know, they need to be clear in your site, whether it's a homepage, collection page, product detail page, they should all kind of embody your story, right? And encourage people to purchase from you and ultimately get them to engage beyond just the purchase, right? You want them to get your your um, your email, you want them to become part of your CRM system, all those things, there has to be value, there has to be an emotional purpose on why somebody would, would, you know, buy from you, but ultimately become long-term customers. Yeah. And I, I think I would like to touch on that point of collecting that email address. I think Dominic, if you can focus on now on making that a priority, because it's going to get harder and harder to um, collect email addresses. I know Apple and Google are looking at these, these email addresses that are short term. When you get to cash, you, you log into your device and you get this, this email address that is, um, is basically a fake one that you give to the retailer going forward. And it's a kind of a one-time use so you can get the the invoice emailed to you, but you don't get a chance to really engage with the consumer. So focus on capturing email addresses now before it gets really difficult for retailers to do that going forward. Great. Great question. Thanks, Dominic. Um, keep them coming, guys, because we do have about, I guess, 15 minutes or so to still go here. Um, let's dump, jump into another one here how artificial intelligence is transforming the e-commerce industry today. Um, AI is a, is a big topic. I was watching Commerce Next um, just last week and sitting in on some of their digital conferences and people are talking about AI. And I, I met with Google just a few weeks ago and the, the stuff that they're doing with artificial intelligence on the search side of it uh, um, and email. You know, I didn't even think of this when they brought it up to my attention is, all of that spell ahead and, and all of that stuff that they are offering up in their email is all artificial intelligence. We just take it for granted that these technologies are now there, but uh, artificial intelligence is finishing your thoughts and email right now too. So um, who wants to jump into uh, where how artificial intelligence can transform the e-commerce industry? Yeah, and, and on, on top of that point, um, I think, so 85% of digital ads are now run by automation. 
I saw that stat. Like that's think about that. That's how you know Joseph. How you used to build the ads, right? Like yeah, that, that's crazy how far we've come. Um, but I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with a company called Gorgeous, but I'm sure there's a, a few that are similar. Customer service platform on the back, and you connect to your own channel or other marketplaces. But they're 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 really getting advanced where you can set up different templates and if customer mentions order in an email or live chat message, there's a response that follows. You know, if they mention tracking, great. So Gorgeous is learning this and saying, okay, they must want a tracking number. Here's a tracking number. This is all like, especially when you first sign up with them, they're learning all this data from you and from their whole ecosystem. And that, you know, it might be an example. People think AI, like all data related. But Chris, like you mentioned, some of it, it's like actually just parsing text together too. And people forget about that. But like all these scripts that were that are happening in the background, you, you are kind of talking to a live person, but you're not in many ways. Like it's, it's all robotic, which is great for the customer, especially if they just want their order number because it never came. And there's their, their tracking number or their order number. So um, that's just one, one use case. Yeah, for sure. And again, like I'm wearing my paid media hat, right? You know, I think you know AI is completely revolution and you know, you know, revolutionized my team's day to day, right? It has over over 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. performance digital, right? Everything from dynamic ad units uh, powered by product feeds across Google and Facebook, Instagram, Snap, TikTok, whatever. I mean, those are entirely powered by artificial intelligence and, and optimized through machine learning, right? Um, Bidding algorithms that we use to to optimize towards you know conversion value or target ROI or any of those things like these are all incredibly powerful tools that literally do hundreds of hours worth of work every minute of every day, right? And it's it's completely revolutionized um, the way that we do this in, in performance digital. I'm excited. Like it's just a matter of time before you know. It, it almost becomes completely dynamic, right? And I and I really think that we're heading towards that um, that spot. But I I for one, you know, I've loved all of the AI and machine learning technology, and we've leveraged every single one that's come through. We've tested every single one, and oftentimes it is it, it will outperform in almost all cases. So um, I, I'm a big fan. Yeah, can I, can I, uh, I have a follow on question for Joseph? Actually, like because. What, especially what you're dealing with on, on, on that agency side, you must have clients that are a bit, um, who, who like to control the brand and the narrative where they're like, okay, show me show me the ad units. And you're like, well, here are the right, like I can't, I can't show you the ad that's gonna be published, right? It's, it's AI. And, and they must be a bit uncomfortable with that. Cause I've seen like some of my former bosses that were, <laughs> were like, show me the ad unit. I'm like, well, here's one of them. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think you know you have to know your client, right? You have to know what they're what they're comfortable with. So we certainly absolutely have clients that are like, you can never use you know dynamic search ads in Google, for example, right? But for the, I mean, very rarely does that happen. Most of our clients love it, right? And a lot of that content is being pulled from the actual product pages themselves. So if it exists on the product, if if, if it exists on the product detail page, why wouldn't it be able to exist in an ad, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, I think from. AI, what I'm excited about is, I don't know, you guys used to do social listening and you would watch all of, you get a social listening tool and you would see all of these comments about your company and you would try to sort through the ones that were relevant. One may be for store and one may be for online. And now there's tools where AI like basically is making recommendations for you to go and say, okay, here's a conversation that you should engage in and you would get some type of lift. Like I saw the demos on this and it's significant and it's so exciting that I don't have to weed through 20,000 comments about my brand that I can, an artificial intelligence that can pick up the key messages and say, go address this one. This is the one that is, you know, maybe it's trending or, or it's a negative thing that you can really easily fix. Like to have artificial intelligence do that sorting for me, what a time saver. I'm excited to see that. And then the listening to the customer, then also you can take that into your email campaigns and your social and serve up relevant content, really creating a unique experience. And, and that's where we're getting to. Like, how many times have I said that having everyone go through the same front door of our website and that it's the same homepage for everyone is so outdated. And why are we still doing that as, as a retailer is beyond me with the technology that's available. It should really be 
tailored that that navigation if i ignored 30 percent of the navigation stop showing me that navigation until i ask for it really simplify that navigation for my experience my journey the banners that i sh see should be customized to me now and okay fine you're you're going to want to see if you can get me into other categories but for the most part based on how often i visit websites it should be a really customer custom experience and AI can really take care of a lot of those things for us now. For sure. All right. So we got maybe five minutes to go here. I don't see any other questions yet from the folks that are listening. So um, I know one of the things people were really looking for, for uh, from this group is any of the top trends that you guys are seeing in the industry um, for e-commerce and whether that's you know, creative, creating high quality content, personalization, where do you think voice search is going? If you guys have, we can wrap it up with this question. I'm sure it can take five minutes to answer this one because it's, it's pretty broad on where you think the industry is going. Don't be shy. Johnny, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so, yeah, loaded, loaded question, right? Because this is kind of if we had to look ahead uh, 12 or 24 months, what's what's going to happen? And and um, I, I can't remember who mentioned it before, but kind of, yeah, I think Joseph, but paid, paid media, right? How mm -hmm. that is shifting. And we might change the name of what that is, but like paid media, when you dump all your money into that to, to bring traffic. Um, yeah, we're, we're seeing so much competition right now and everyone Everyone's on Facebook and Google and, and Insta as, as the platforms, right? You go to and 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 then what happens? Like your 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 return on ad spends are all dipping, right? And and you're all playing the same playground. And then TikTok TikTok comes and Snap comes and then some people slowly change over, you know. So I'm really interested to see what happens uh, there. Do I have a guess? Um, I don't think Google and Facebook are going to lose in this, and right. like. You know, especially Google. Google, you know, they're, out of all the companies that we talk about with Apple and, and Facebook and uh, Amazon, people are criticizing Google for maybe not adapting as quick to the others, especially from a shopping perspective, because they still haven't figured that out. Um, but but I wouldn't underestimate. I, I feel like there's something brewing there, you know. And they've talked about the shopping thing a bit. They have some integrations with Shopify that are a good start. Um, but I think there's something there. So I'm, I'm still bullish on on Google and figuring what, what's going to happen there as a as a trend. Um, and uh, you know I, I you know I'm going to go back to go, like just what Shopify is doing. Um, you know I, I come from enterprise retailers and haven't used Shopify in my full time job. Did it on the side, but. Uh, full-time job uh, for my whole career and then in the last three years have used Shopify extensively Shopify plus and Shopify and just how far it's come and how far it's going and and you know every every three months it's like now we're doing subscriptions and they don't do it perfectly I'm not going to say they do it because when they announce it then it's another year before it's really good and mm -hmm. and now the last three months you guys saw like we're going to make cross-border easily we're going to make shipping globally easily we're going to collect custom duties and figure that all out so they, they launched that and they said it and, and it's not going to work now, right? Like we know this, it's going to be like in a year. So again, you have a product in Canada or, or the US that you need to get to Europe. Now, now we're talking a grander scale, right? And if you don't have the paid media budget, like we just talked about, that's getting smaller. Why not invest in the logistics component of that and really open up your market? And maybe you find a hot you know, place in Europe, like a, a hot market in Europe for your product. So interesting to see the global trend and what Shopify does to the industry in the next year or two. Yeah, it's really, it's, and I agree 100%. It's really been interesting to see Shopify's growth within enterprise as well, right? So we work with you know, everyone from investor funded startups to really big international brands. And it's really interesting to see, you know, working with some of these larger brands to see that they're actually running Shopify experiences, right? You often would think Shopify is more for SMB types. Right, that larger enterprise level um, platform like Magento or, or others would be more suited for enterprise, but they're capturing share within within the enterprise space, which is super uh, super interesting. Um, I think in terms of trend, like obviously iOS fourteen point five, it was big. I think privacy in general is gonna is gonna be really interesting to watch over the next twelve months, especially if. Apple kind of releases some of these things that Chris, you were you were talking about earlier, because um, that could make you know a marketer's lives and 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 
you know, a lot of SMBs specifically, uh, it could put a, a real challenge, you know, a, a real challenge that, that they don't know how to answer yet. Yeah. I think, you know, the one trend I'll, I'll say to keep watching, because I think it's going to come fast, is voice search and um, how f retailers and any customers will be able to leverage that. Like, I, I keep envisioning this experience where, you know, you're watching a show and no longer do you have to go to your device and type in, you know, I love Johnny's golf shirt, so I want to be able to look up that golf shirt that he's wearing today. I'm just going to ask for it. I'm just going to, like speak out loud in my house, whether it's a Google device or an Amazon device or my mobile that picks it up, something, some device is going to find me that product instantly to, uh, to purchase. And when I think about, you know, projects like our home, home hardware does, if I'm outside and I'm working on a project and I see that I'm running out of screws to be able to just speak to my device and say, order me the, the extra items that I need and, and, you know, so many companies are now getting into same day delivery within a few hours it's going to be delivered and I don't have to pick up, don't have to clean up. I don't have to dust off. I don't have to get into the car. Voice search is going to like really change the game. Um, and how do you become as a retailer relevant to be the top search result for those types of engagements? It's different when a customer like clicks onto your a direct link to your website, does a search and buys, but, no longer will I be thinking about brand who I'm shopping with. I'm going to be thinking about situational and I'm going to be thinking about the product that I need and not necessarily the brand. I'm just going to ask for it. So it's going to be interesting how retailers bubble up to the top and do they race to the bottom on price to win the customer. And I, I tell you, if you're trying to win based on that, you're not going to last long. So how are you, how are you going to offer that value proposition in a, in a voice search world? Yeah. And how you speak and type is, very different, right? So yeah. good point on like the the optimization. I'm just picturing like again going back to Shopify, the back end of Shopify and how you input like SEO text for desktop and mobile and how you input SEO text for voice search, right? Just having that capability right simply like that. Yeah, I just think anyone doing it's gonna win, right? Like you think of how many times you, uh, I have a 14 year old, I don't see him type anything anymore. He he uses that microphone on the phone better than anybody and you know what they don't even proof the the the, the uh the text output that that thing does it's just like send they're like they'll figure it out dad I'm like, okay <laughs> they will. the amount of times i hear hey google or alexa <laughs> my house is you come from my kid's voice they're unbelievable yeah yeah so and it's it's just gonna they're getting into the age group now that they've been growing up with this they're gonna be spenders soon right like it's, for sure. They've been spending our money for the last number of years, but soon they're going to have their own jobs. And, you know, you talk about even with video content, I don't remember the last time my son watched a movie, like to sit through an hour and 20 minutes of a movie. No way. It's five, 10 minutes of content. And then he's on to the next video and even five, 10 minutes with TikTok is long. So, you know, I, I think so. Ted last was a great show, but I, I think a part of that attractiveness, it's like, it's like 24 minute episodes, 30 minutes, right? It's in that gap and it's like done, 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 done. And I think you talked about content. I, I think that's a real, one of the catchy things about why Ted Lasso is so popular. It's like such brief episodes. It goes so fast. Well, and it can make you cry. I was on a whim, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Hey guys, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Um, I, I, I got excited about this one because I, I had 90... 95 people say that they were coming to this event. And I mean, based on the ups and downs, I would probably say that half of them made it throughout the, the night. But uh, thank you so much for, for taking part on my third live Q&A. Um, so that, that was exciting. It's been five months of delivering e-commerce now, and it just keeps growing. And it's from having great guests like you guys. Uh, I know um, on all my videos, nobody comments, but I do know because I get the phone calls and I have the dialogue through them in private messaging. They love the value that folks like you guys are bringing and it, it's greatly appreciated from, from me. So thank you so much for, for being here tonight, guys. Thanks for, for having me. Right. Okay, we'll do this again in probably another month or so and uh, we'll, uh, we'll have to look for having a thousand fo followers that say they're gonna come and then maybe half of those guys will show up. Black Friday edition. Love yeah, it. let's do that. We'll talk about all the deals that are happening. <laughs> and the, the fact that they're out of stock on those deals. 
<laughs> yeah, no sales this year. No sales. No sales. Seriously. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Have a good one. Thanks, guys. Take care.